Hello everyone and welcome to Smokes, the Urban Cycling Institute podcast. And on today's show we have with us here uh, Chris and Melissa Bruntlett, who are the authors of the very well-selling book. Uh, <laughs> Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality. Thank you. I uh, failed a few times at remembering that title. Um, so you two have been here for nine months now in this country, uh, coming from Canada, right? Show them your gloves, Chris. Uh, <laughs> they were actually a gift from the mayor of Ottawa, yeah, uh, who was in The Hague for a uh, bit of a study tour. So he came bearing gifts for the entire Dutch delegation and I had uh -huh. to explain to him why there was a Canadian there to sell him on the idea of Dutch cycling. That's awesome. So you, you were here uh, nine months ago and you've been living in Delft ever since. That's right. Yeah, right. We, uh, we'd actually never been to Delft, uh -huh. but um, because both of our job opportunities were here, we decided to take a, take a shot, yeah. move somewhere small, much smaller than where we came from. Um, and yeah, so far, I think we'd both say we love it here. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you run us through the, uh, the experience of first landing here for the first time and then having, I'd say, the honeymoon phase where everything is amazing and the cycling and then uh, how you feel about this place today. Yeah, it's, I mean, we still find ourselves pinching ourselves almost yeah. every morning uh, <laughs> that we're here, uh, not only living in this place, but getting to do the jobs that we do. Um, and it really just began with a series of blog posts that we wrote in 2016, a, uh, um, a, a working holiday, if you will, uh, to visit a series of Dutch cities and, uh, and write about them for, for uh, our blog. And, um, that snowballed into the book that we wrote yeah. and uh, almost three years of, of uh, lusting after uh, what the Dutch had accomplished and, and wanting to be a part of it ourselves. Uh, so when we landed here in mid-February, it was quite surreal to actually, you know, have an apartment in Delft and uh, to get to ride these cycle tracks that we had uh, written about and photographed. Uh, and, and toward the world talking about uh, yeah. for such a long period of time. Um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, this red asphalt, this this these four meters of separated cycling uh, are something that most Dutch people now take for granted. And we're starting to take for granted living here. But um, there's uh, cities around the world that are uh, this is where this is just a pipe dream. Ah. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think, um, you know, talking about starting to take it for granted, uh, we just left my office. I'm about a five minute bike ride going very slow from uh -huh. the office to house. And I've actually changed my route <laughs> um, because the option was there and um, the other option had too much bike traffic. So I decided to go a different route, take a little bit of stress out of my morning. Um, and even add a little bit of time so I get yeah. some exercise. I mean, my commute back in Canada was 30 minutes easy by bike so and you lived in vancouver right we before did. You came here. yeah we were living in east vancouver um my daily commute involved a ride along the glorious seawall which i do miss sometimes oh the seawall yeah okay. but uh yeah it's, it's funny because i sometimes i don't take it for granted and i think it's great that i have so many options and other times i'm just like don't even think about it i get on my bike and i go and yeah. See where I end up. <laughs> and uh, you two are parents of uh, two kids, right? Yes. Uh, we... How are they doing on their transition? <laughs> They're actually doing remarkably well. And um, when we first started talking about this move back in Canada, mm -hmm. I think we both really tried to emphasize that, yeah, the bikes are great here. Yeah. But for, for us, I think the move was more about them. Yeah. And we saw that almost immediately moving here because uh, Dutch kids just grow up with this greater sense of independence because of these cycle tracks and because the cities have been slowed down. Yeah. And so I think within a month of being here, our son was biking to visit a friend in a nearby town and we didn't think anything of it. Our daughter is like typical teenager and gone all the time. <laughs> and how's their Dutch? <laughs> their Dutch out? is oh, yeah? actually amazing. <laughs> And uh, their, their education is in Dutch now, right? Their education is wow, entirely incredible. in Dutch, yeah. So they're uh, making Dutch friends. Yeah. They're, yesterday we heard our daughter speaking with several kids, laughing and doing the <laughs> teenage way of not really speaking to each other, but speaking in Dutch. <laughs> um, and it's, it's really remarkable to see. We're really happy 
yeah. with how things are going with them. Um, and it's exactly why we wanted to come here, was to give them the opportunity to have that independence and freedom. And they're really thriving because of it. Wow. Okay. Uh, so great place to raise a kid. Uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's something that you, you talked a bit about in your book, about how it's, it's so friendly and, and kids play on the street and, and such, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it was our, actually our 2016 visit to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam specifically, where the kids who were seven and nine at the time really got their first ta taste of freedom and that we were letting them uh, go to the park in the corner store in our neighborhood in Amsterdam all uh -huh. by themselves, just walking. Uh, and, and for them, uh, they really, uh, <laughs> I think it, it opened up the whole new world. So when it, it came time to come home uh, after that experience of having that freedom, they were quite upset and actually cried when <laughs> it was time to come back to Canada because they knew that virtually anywhere they would go in Vancouver, they'd have to uh, be escorted by mommy and daddy because uh, it was basically a four or six lane road of, of 60 or 80 kilometer hour traffic standing yeah. between them and the community center and their school and the shops and all the places they wanted to go. So um, like Melissa said, it's, it's never really been about the bikes. It's been about uh, the cities, uh, the way the Dutch have kept the car at arm's length from, from their cities and allowed people to uh, move freely without uh, being limited by by cars. Incredible. Uh, I just wanted to make a note of the landscape that we're riding through. That is a huge windmill right there in the <laughs> middle of the city. We got the canals, we got bikes. Uh, it doesn't really get more Dutch than this, does it? No, no it really doesn't. <laughs> um... Delft is, uh, <laughs> is really kind of a, a postcard city. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things we've we've really enjoyed over the last uh, few months is going back through the Google Street View and the archival photos and seeing what the streets of Delft used to look like mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years ago. This stretch that we're riding along, for example, uh, there was an elevated railway viaduct that cut the city in half. Yeah. Uh, and the before photos are quite dramatic. The entire city was uh, broken in two by this elevated railway with cars parked below it. Uh, and the city spent 15 years and, and upwards of a billion dollars to bury the the train tracks and put in the canals and the green space and the cycle tracks and the tramways uh, and, and I think it's really emblematic of uh, Dutch cities willingness to transform themselves uh, and invest a lot of time and energy and, and, and money wow. uh, into making their streets better and there's this continual improvement that's taking place that really uh, is now a, a privilege to be a part of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you work for the Dutch Cycling Embassy, Chris, and you've been well, traveling quite a bit all around the world. What are some highlights of that job in the nine months that uh, you've been here? Yeah. <laughs> what a tour. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, one of the reasons why we decided to pack up and move here is I, was, uh, I received a, a job offer from the Dutch Cycling Embassy as their new marketing and communications manager. Um, and that job has kind of been uh, twofold. We, we do a lot of hosting of internal, uh, international delegations that come to the Netherlands on study tours of politicians and engineers. Yeah. Uh, and the best part of that is just seeing, uh, as my director Lucas often says, <laughs> the twinkle cool. in people's eyes when they see and experience this cycling culture for the first time and they suddenly realize that their city can be, can be better, can be different as yeah. well. Uh, and then the second part of the, the job is, yes, traveling overseas. We were just in Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, holding workshops and presentations and trying to uh, help cities with their specific uh, contexts and challenges and, and helping them find the opportunities to improve. Uh, it's not always a, a Dutch uh, inspired one size fits all solution, but right. uh, there's always something, some kind of inspiration they can take from here that uh, they can apply to their own city. Uh, and uh, Melissa, you've uh, been working at another company in, in Delft, and that is the... Uh, Movicon. Movicon, work, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I started How working... Uh, yep. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So Movicon is actually a very fortunate uh, sort of accident in terms mm -hmm. of a job almost. Um, we were very familiar with the company because we had written about two of their employees, Leonard Nout and Angela Vandercliff, in the book. Um, and then happened to be in Ottawa, where they have, had, uh, they have a Canadian office in Ottawa, Canada, yeah. um, who helped coordinate our book tour. Yeah. And 
uh, and the event in Ottawa and the CEO, Johan Diepens, happened to be in town. Yeah. And I just like to be quite Dutch about it and just said, hey, <laughs> if you need somebody for communications, I'm coming your way. Yeah. Uh, and it worked out really well. So I manage the international communications for MobiCon. So we have, as it's a Dutch company, they've got a very established team that does a lot of the Dutch communications. And then I support the team in, uh, in Canada, in the US, and then yeah. our... Well, <laughs> All right, this is the one bad spot. Yeah. <laughs> Hold that thought. Hold that, Hold thought. that thought. I'm going to just get out of the way. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Uh, and yeah, I also support our Dutch colleagues that work in international markets. So we have people working in the UK and Germany, and we're exploring opportunities elsewhere in Europe as well. Yeah. And it's really cool to. Yeah, I mean, I was doing a similar job in North America for an urban planning firm there um, with a much broader scope when it comes to urban planning and engineering. So it's now very nice to be sort of really sort of niche into promoting transportation and cycling and walking, not just in the Netherlands and seeing what's happening here, but also, you know, helping to create those environments back in Canada and I mean, working on projects or helping support projects in towns where we used to live that will go unnamed for now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really neat to see that connection of like the the job I had, the, the you know, the work that we used to do now translating into helping companies here bring that knowledge there as well. And what do you think uh, are the, the biggest difficulties that you've had, the biggest difficulties in translating all this Dutch awesomeness that you've been seeing and then in your trips back to North America and trying yeah. to explain it to people? Yeah, I th that's a really easy question, <laughs> um, at least for me anyways. Uh, the, the real difficulty lies in uh, the Dutch are so far advanced, like we're talking 40 or 50 years from virtually everybody else. They're building parking garages for 12,000 bikes. They're putting cycle paths on the roofs of schools. Uh, most cities can't even imagine being at that place. So the real challenge lies in giving them practical ground level, <laughs> ground level steps. Okay. Um, first steps that they can take uh, on that long and very difficult journey towards becoming uh, a cycling city. Um, because I think when, when, especially when we have delegations come here from overseas, uh, it's easy to show off and, and, and show all yeah. the spectacular infrastructure, and, uh, but unless you make it really practical and pragmatic for them, um, that all that showing off can be for naught because uh, they just don't know where to begin or they'll dismiss it as, oh, well, that's something that, that works for their country that would never work here. Yeah. And it's yeah. something we really try to do with the book um, and something that we try to do, both of us, in our daily work and our social media presence is making uh, these concepts and ideas relatable and applicable to other more car dominated contexts. Cool. And uh, speaking of social media presence, how did you grow this thing, <laughs> uh, Modacity? How, how did it become such a big heavy hitter? And, and when did you really, I'd say, like, hit it off? Like when with there, there's a kink point where it kind of yeah. takes its life yeah. its own like well it's yeah. an interesting sort of journey because I, I think we talk about it in the book we've talked about it in presentations that chris and i really started out in doing the same thing but in two very different places me from the perspective of a mom mm -hmm. who's traveling around with her two kids and chris more from the um hedonistic perspective and writing marketing and promotion yeah, marketing and promotion and um really we were doing the same thing and i think it really reached a pivot point in 2014 when we actually created Modacity and decided to do more of a joint collaboration with the guiding principle that whatever we share, whatever we do, our main focus is to show the positive mm -hmm. angles, to, to not try to get bogged down in the fights. I mean, we were still having the same fights at our local level, still pushing for you know, changes to infrastructure or a relaxation of certain archaic laws yeah. that were applying to cycling and dissuading people from cycling. That was a very <laughs> political way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> anyways. Um, anyways, but that was our, that was the point is that everything that we show be attainable. Someone mm -hmm. could understand the, the positive as opposed to really feeding into that really bikes versus yeah. cars mentality. And I think that that is sort of how we made our mark is, yeah. is really well, focusing on 
well, the you, positive feelings that come from it. I think you made this brilliant observation in 2016, again, when we were here documenting our stay in video and photographs, and you observed that uh, Dutch cycling content is like the cat videos <laughs> Uh, for <laughs> the internet, but for urbanists, yeah, because yeah. you could put anything up there. If it's a, a kid or an elderly person or a disabled person, or just showing how universal cycling is here, it, it, it will get shared and shared and shared again. Yeah. Um, so we, I think we just have uh, a different eye coming here as outsiders. Uh, what most Dutch people see is mundane, the, the perching of, on the back rack of a bicycle. Uh, you know, giving per a friend a lift. The mm -hmm. groups of teenagers riding around. The groups, around. Of, oh, the groups <laughs> of teenagers, <laughs> yeah. You gotta watch out for those. <laughs> to, to most Dutch people, they're just uh, traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, but to us, there's, there's a beautiful human element to it. Uh, and, and to us, it's uh, uh, what all cities sh should be striving for in terms of getting everybody cycling and not just the, uh, the fit white dudes. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, the, the kids, I, I think, uh, in in Eindhoven, uh, where I do some lecturing um, during their frost week, everyone's on a bike. I thought yeah. that, that was, that's, that's just brilliant. And uh, you can see the international students like yeah. struggling a bit, right? Uh, because uh, it, it's some some of them are, it's their like first time yeah. on a bike right. for a while, and they're like weaving around. And this is frost week; they're all drunk. So <laughs> yeah, no, and they're, yeah. they're cycling to the bar, they're cycling to class, they're yeah. cycling to McDonald's. They're just like any other students. They've just yeah. been given this other transportation option that happens to be all these great things, healthy, environmentally beneficial. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think that's kind of, as Melissa said, we're, we're focused on the positivity, we're f focused on the humanity, uh, and we're trying to show how easy it can be if, if you have a little bit of political vision and, uh, and, and some leadership at the uh, municipal level to, to help make these changes, but it's not going to be easy. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Although uh, the Dutch make it look easy. The Dutch do make it look easy. Uh, so is there anything that you, you miss about home? <laughs> I'm on oh, I mean, there's tons of stuff that we miss about home. So we're, we're, I mean, we're Canadian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's things that we'll always miss about the Canadian culture or I have I will admit I have more maple syrup in my cupboard that people bring me yes, <laughs> than the average person request. should. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, my Dutch colleagues tease me a lot about it, but hey, whatever, it's good stuff. Um, I mean, when it comes to Vancouver, I mean, we obviously miss our friends um, and I miss the ocean and the mountains. Mm -hmm. But what we've traded that for here um, in terms of the quality of life and I think we both feel a lot less stressed, feel a lot more happy. The kids as I said, they're thriving and they yeah. both seem a lot happier here uh, despite missing their friends back home. I think, you know, we know we've made the right, right move for now. Yeah. Um, and there's just so much to discover in the Netherlands that we haven't had a chance to see yet. And we're now like in the gateway to Europe. So <laughs> it's hard to miss it when it's only been nine months. Talk to us maybe in five years and see how we're yeah. doing. <laughs> and you, you took a train trip all the way to Switzerland uh, a few months back, right? We but did, yeah. How long was that journey and uh, how was that experience <laughs> being on a train for so long compared to, I guess, flying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we... Uh... It was all over Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> with the, you know, with, with having access to this kind of continent-wide rail yeah. network for the first time, uh, we wanted to make use of it and and quite frankly you know with the uh we find i think i, I can sp speak for both of us we find travel train travel a lot more relaxing in that you don't have the the pre-boarding process and the security lineups and uh the limited leg room uh and so we wanted to give it a try uh, yeah it was uh five connecting trains and 12 hours to get uh from delft to Bern. uh-huh and then 15 hours coming home due to a couple of delays on the German train system. Um, but that also comes down to just because it's new to us and we don't know better. There were other uh, options available and we're like, oh, this seems like the easiest. Right. But um, some of the yeah. connections were quite tight. And yeah, yeah. In, in hindsight, we would have maybe take, spent a little bit more money to take. There was basically a direct train from Paris to uh, Basel. Mm. Uh, Basel. Basil, 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 basil. <laughs> potato, <laughs> potato. Switzerland is cool because they also have uh, quite a bit of cycling going on there, especially in the major cities. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, it's funny because I think Chris said this one thing when we were in Toronto years ago, 
um, when we were already fully immersed into the cycling world is that in Toronto, they tend to cycle in spite of the lack of infrastructure. Yeah. And I, I think I'm accurate in saying that was very much our experience in Switzerland as well, is they do have a remarkable number of people that are cycling. They do, yeah. Um, despite a lack of protected in infrastructure in key places, despite the fact that it's hilly, despite the fact that they also get a lot of rain. And it, it was pretty cool to see. Uh, I think we were very impressed with Fern in yeah. terms of not only what they're already doing, but the vision that's coming from the mm -hmm. city. Um, it's very cool to see. What really kind of uh, turned our worldview on its head uh, was the fact that basically the biggest barrier to getting more people cycling in Bern and Zurich and other Swiss cities is the public transport system. So uh, ah. the car, car usage in Bern is about the same as Delft. I think it's uh, around 20%. Uh, but the vast majority of trips there, over 50% were made on the tram network. Right. Um, and, and something like 90% of those trips are under three kilometers. So there's this potential of getting people out of the trams onto bicycles, but you uh, obviously run the risk of cannibalizing your public transport system. Yeah. Um, and then also when you were riding on the streets, the trams were kind of the biggest uh, discomfort was uh, they were right next to you as you were cycling along rather than, than cars as we are used to experiencing. So um, yeah, I, I think they've got some difficult decisions to make in terms of how many people they want to get off the tram network and on the bicycles, <laughs> um, which is a, a problem that most cities would probably love to, <laughs> yeah, love to love have. To have right? Their car usage is, is pretty good. Uh, and, and their city center was very quiet and clean and uh, almost car free. And, and it did remind us a lot of a Dutch city. It's just they'd accomplished uh, the same thing through their tram network rather than mm. their cycling network. And there's some uh, really beautiful train rides in that country up the oh, mountain, yeah. down the mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, I think the, our most memorable day, memorable day was uh, we took the uh, cog railway to the peak of Pilatus. Mount Mount Pilatus. Oh. In uh, is that the highest railway? Is that the one? Or? It's the steepest, steepest. cog railway, okay. steepest and oldest, I think. Uh, in Seven thousand feet, uh, forty-eight degree yeah. slope. That's forty-eight the, degree. Yeah. So were you like uh, lean back yeah. in your seat? No, it's, it's really neat. They've got it set up so like the train is running on an angle, uh -huh. but then the seats are are done at like a normal like train <laughs> grade. Like <laughs> Yeah, so it's very uh it's a very interesting experience. It helps because Etienne, our son, is has a little bit of a fear of heights. Yeah. So not leaning backwards and looking up the mountain was very Ooh, helpful. And also yeah. not leaning forwards and looking down. So Cool. Yeah, it was very neat. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, how are we doing <laughs> on this uh, route? Are we? Yeah, um, I mean, I can we're, actually we're talk about. Out. Yeah. Well, well, if we go up over that bridge and back. Okay. And yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Why don't we talk a bit about uh, this canal and this environment that we're going through? Because uh, I think one of the cool things about uh, our, our time here so far has been showing up this place to our parents. Uh -huh. uh, all four of our parents are in their 60s, newly retired. Uh, come from fairly car dependent suburbs of Toronto. Yeah. And uh, they've heard us talk about the Netherlands for years Ever. and years and years, <laughs> this magical place where uh, we eventually moved. And uh, to see them experience it for the first time and actually get on a bicycle here uh, was, was quite special. And this was, uh, I think, the first route that we brought all of them on because it's fairly low stress and uh, quite scenic along the river, although you can tell from the, all the construction they're doing right yeah. now. Um, but the, the really special thing was uh, my mom in particular, she was having trouble balancing on the bike. She hadn't cycled in 50 years since she was a teenager. Uh, but we were able to rent this uh, Duo Feats from a, a nonprofit in Delft, which is basically a side-by-side -side, uh, bicycle that seats two people, uh, well, I'd say tricycle, Tricycle. Okay. Yeah. So uh, her and my father got to cycle along here, you know, uh, with fairly minimal effort, and and we ended up doing like 25 kilometers that day. Wow. Uh, with my mom, and and to see her out there and experiencing the joy that uh, everyone else was experiencing, despite not being as physically able, uh, um, it was a, a rather memorable moment. What about your parents, Melissa? What about my parents? <laughs> well. So, <laughs> I don't know where to start. Um, 
I grew up cycling with my family. It's just something that we did. We go for family bike rides. Um, so it's, it's interesting now to make, to make cycling so, for it to be such an important part of my life. So I wouldn't say that we ever thought anything of it. It was just like, hey, let's go for a family ride or let's ride to the park. Um, but now, whenever they visit, they know they have to go for a bike ride. <laughs> um, but they've been able, they've been quite fortunate to be able to join us on a few of our trips. So actually when we were touring Australia, yeah. they joined us for four weeks and cycled in Brisbane and Melbourne. I don't think in Sydney, um, but in also in Auckland and Wellington. Anyways, Christ I digress. Church. Christchurch. And so they've experienced those cities and they're like, oh, these are such great places. They, they love cycling in Brisbane, which for, for us, coming from our context, we're like, oh, there's so much work to do. But yeah. for them, it was just like this, like this epiphany of like, oh, you can cycle along the water for countless kilometers. So then we bring them here and we're like, yeah, you can cycle anywhere for <laughs> countless kilometers. So they got to cycle around Delft with us. Um, my dad joined Atien for his commute to, mm -hmm. to school, which was interesting. <laughs> oh yeah, I think I scared the crap out of him. Because <laughs> um, we went along the T Delft route where, oh, yes. uh, during rush so hour and crazy it was shoulder that, yeah. to shoulder. I think he was a little bit uh, stressed out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then we even got to cycle in Rotterdam, which was really nice. Uh, we went out, went out for a day without the kids and Took them to uh, Caps of Brouwers. Yeah. Enjoyed a beer together. And although there were a few moments, because they're not used to this, there's still, there's still some moments that are quite stressful for them, mm -hmm. which we can't, I mean, you can't underestimate those because people talk about international cycling in Amsterdam or other big cities and feeling intimidated. And it's, you know, it's important to acknowledge that and be patient with it. Um, but I think despite feeling stressed, she, at the end, she did say it was really nice to be able to have that moment yeah. of just, riding around and covering a lot more ground than she would have been able to do if we just walked so i i want to get speaking of like uh people who are less like able right uh might have difficulty in these environments i want to get your thoughts on uh, electric mobility because in the netherlands uh, now there is more new e-bikes sold than normal bikes mm -hmm. right so how has that do you think enabled more people perhaps to take on this uh activity and whether it is a positive development well i think we'd both agree yeah. that it is a positive development we write a whole we wrote a whole chapter about it <laughs> oh, we yes. write a whole chapter about <laughs> it a chapter in there. but um yeah i think there are certainly some challenges as you implement speed into the equation when it comes to an e-bike but really, you know, our research that we found was that they're not using it. To, people aren't using e-bikes to go faster. They're just using yeah. them to make things a little bit easier and to go a little bit further. And if that means that we're encouraging people to ride who maybe don't have the stamina to go as far or want to be able to age in place, but still maintain that level of mobility, mm -hmm. then I think it's a very, very big net positive. I mean, both of our parents, well, mine in particular, have talked about getting e-bikes back home just to make things a bit easier for getting around. Yeah. I think we've even talked about getting e-bikes <laughs> to be able to go a little bit further. Uh -huh. You know, we're getting up there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> speak for yourself, Sunshine. <laughs> hey, four decades next year, yeah. right? All right, all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I heard them eloquently referred to as a uh, range extender the other day, and I think that's, quite succinctly puts it down it's it's not about traveling faster it's not about being lazy it's mm. it's about enabling people that want to cycle more who feel like certain trips are impossible or too far or outside of the Netherlands too hilly yeah or too sweaty and and giving them that extra physical boost but also psychological boost to make those trips possible well that's what we saw when we were in Bern is you know I don't I'm not going to throw out a number but a lot of people <laughs> We're on e-bikes. I mean, sure. half of their bike share fleet are e-bikes to enable okay. those trips. Yeah, Switzerland's a fairly hilly place. We were in Auckland, a city built on 50 dormant volcanoes. Uh, yeah, the same thing. And, and this is the you know one of the pushbacks we always get over oh, the Netherlands flat. The Netherlands is flat. Well, okay, but uh, if you enable electromobility by uh, giving people access to e-bikes, uh, 
and incentivizing e-bikes, e giving to them use secure them. parking and infrastructure, uh, then you run out of excuses very quickly. Right, yeah. Uh, and actually, it occurred to me the other day, I was shopping online, preparing for a trip I plan to do this summer to uh, the Black Sea along Eurovelo 6, so along the, the Danube and uh, Austria and all that. And, nice. and it's, it's a bit hilly, but I figured if I can bring an e-bike with me, then it gives me at least an extra like 30 kilometers a day of free energy. That yeah. I could, you know, take me a bit further and not be as strenuous. Yeah. This range extension, as you've mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the studies uh, are showing that people, the health benefits are as good, if not greater, because people are riding e-bikes further distances and more often yeah. uh, than they would a regular push bike. And, and so I think there's very few uh, e-bike cynics left in the in the cycling world and uh, you know frankly uh, the world is going to pass them by at some point yeah it's, it's the prices are plummeting they're, yeah. they're so they're getting so light and easy to use and I so. think there's I think there's still like a misconception around e-bikes is people think of them as like the speed pedelec right? right yeah and we really try to talk about that when we're presenting or speaking with people is it's not we're not talking about the bikes where you don't have to pedal. Like these are, I mean, th you know, those are fine too, whatever. Um, but when we, most people are talking about e-bikes, they're talking about just giving someone an assist. Yeah. So like putting a gentle hand on someone's back and pushing them up a hill. You know, if that's- Wind in the back. Wind in the back, exactly. Yeah. Now, I mean, having said all that, I think these types of new machines need to be taken into consideration when you're designing your infrastructure. And one of the things we saw uh, on our travels is bike lanes that have been built way too narrow without mm. allowing people to pass each other or ride side by side. And I think that presents a, uh, well, they're not future proofed. And, and uh, if you do want people to use your infrastructure, uh, a variety of abilities and speeds, then you do have to build them wide enough uh, to allow for passing and, and, uh, and social cycling. And uh, unfortunately, cities that are uh, hesitant to give up that space are, are building infrastructure that's just way too narrow. Right. Oh. Uh, you're, you're, you're being encouraged, from what I've heard, to write another book. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know yeah. how much you're allowed to talk about that, but what are some ideas that have percolating in your mind, generating that you sure. think about, you know, about the Netherlands now that you've actually lived here. Yeah, well, I think without spoiling the plot. Don't spoil the plot. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> I think um, we talked in the first book about um, a lot of the, the how. The how. This one's yeah. Hard. Yeah. Yeah, 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 a lot of the how um, without getting too much into the weeds of the technical details. And because we don't profess to be technical experts, we're mm -hmm. just experiential experts. Yes, experiential <laughs> experts. That's, that's, that's a good word. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and I think a lot of the conversation uh, now needs to go more towards what it actually means when you build all this stuff yeah. to the people that experience those cities. And so I think that's where we would like to probably focus is more on the people experiencing it. Mm -hmm. Reflecting on our experiences moving here, our children's experiences. Yes. Uh, perhaps telling some of the stories of the policies that made those experiences possible uh, and some of the research that backs that up. So it's, I think it all comes down to yeah, the, right. the, the qualitative uh, experience of living in a city with fewer cars. And, and uh, that at the end of the day is what it's about. It's not about the bicycle. It's not about the bicycle infrastructure. Uh, it's about how people can thrive when uh, motor vehicles are kept under control and, and kept uh, within uh, <laughs> limits, <laughs> within we say, limits yes. rather yeah. than ruling the city and, and being allowed to uh, roam freely and, and, and travel the speeds that they want to. You make them mm -hmm. sound like horses. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, so the, I mean, we could talk at length about what that means, but for us it means uh, a city that constantly engages our senses where you know we can hear the birds mm -hmm. we can hear the church bells uh, we see neighbors we yes. can see neighbors um, 
we can smell, we can taste, we can, and, and these are kind of all things that we've forgotten because uh, we've got six lanes of traffic at our front door in most, yeah. most contexts. Um, uh, that is all. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> no, that, that gets back down to the very basics. Is the, the first book you went around and you talked to the practitioners really, right? Like you went to city officials, you went to consultants, right? All from mm -hmm. the professional aspect. Yeah. So th this wouldn't make sense as a logical next step now that you're here and you, yeah. you can talk about it from firsthand experience. Well, and focusing on the less obvious yeah. benefits, because I think we all know the public health, the uh, traffic congestion, the uh, the carbon emissions, all of these things oh, sorry. that- Sorry. It's okay, yeah. <laughs> rattle, rattle, rattle. No worries. <laughs> Uh, we know the obvious benefits, but we I think there's all these really subtle, squishy things that uh, that we the get. Intangible. Yeah, uh, of, of a city that's perhaps more socially connected and trusting and mm -hmm. uh, and more equitable and accessible to everybody. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think we're right now. The big question is where we find the time to delve into this project. But it is. <laughs> taking shape in our minds, if not on paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, and you also still, I believe, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the company Modacity yes. is still running. Yeah. Uh, do you have a vision for that uh, going forward <laughs> now that the book is out and you, you're an here? You know? Excellent question, yeah. George. <laughs> Company, um, company in air quotes, maybe. Yeah, hey, it's a registered hey, company. It's registered. And, it exists. At the Cave <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it, oh, it's a Dutch company It's a Dutch too. company. All right. Cool. Um, I think we both see the value in keeping Modacity going, if not as a um, business in terms of money-making mm -hmm. adventure, but in terms of still providing that inspiration. Um, I think people will have noticed that at least on the website, the content level has reduced since yes. moving here. Well, because, you've been outputting in other places, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Our, our energy is now focused on for myself, MobiCon, for Chris, the Dutch Cycling Embassy, but we still want to provide that inspiration where we can. Um, and of course, the book is still out there. Uh, we've had three reprints now? No. We yeah, it's, on, it's on its third edition. edition. So um, there's still promotion to be done for the book. And so we're still doing speaking opportunities when invited. Mm -hmm. And, and there've been some requests for foreign language translation as well, which yeah. has been quite interesting. I think what's exciting though is I, they're not, um, there's not a ton of them, but we have new opportunities now with Dutch partners that we've made over right. the years. So last year we got to work with the International Cargo Bike Festival and we'll do that again this oh, that year. Is, they were fun. Yeah. yeah. Riding around those cargo bikes. Yeah. And I mean, Jos and Tom that are, are organizing it are like fantastic to work with. Yeah. Um, so organizations like that we'll continue to partner with and support where we can. And yeah, it's sort of it's still, a, it's gone back to being a passion project as opposed to a full time job. Wow. Which is nice. Yeah. And uh, where can they find you guys on the internet? Because mm. you're everywhere. So why don't you just <laughs> rattle it off? I'll put a right. I'll put a link in the description below, and then yeah, uh, people can well, go Modacity find you. Well, Modacity is on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn at Modacity Life. Yeah. Uh, M O D A City Life. Um, Dutch Cycling Embassy likewise is on all social media channels. If you just type it in, uh, I think it's Cycling underscore Embassy. Yeah. Uh, and MobiCon, similarly. Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, <laughs> at MobiCon or at MobiCon NL. You guys are killing it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, any any ideas for? I know Chris, you had a, you're actually a filmmaker. So any any ideas to expand into the video world? <laughs> <laughs> Not at this point. I mean, uh, we yeah. are at the Dutch Cycling Embassy. We're working on a series of uh, webinars uh, online. Uh, kind of video clips that will uh, provide tutorials on, on Dutch cycling concepts, but I'm just kind of overseeing the production. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, uh, but some of my uh, experience will be helpful in, in bringing those together with an outside consultant. Um, yeah, I, I mean, and we're also working on a podcast, which is uh, a similar kind of deal in terms of arranging the interviews and mm -hmm. shaping the storylines. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as <laughs> our free time goes, it's it's what free time? Yeah, yeah. it's fairly <laughs> limited, and uh, it's focused on making sure 
that we get to enjoy the Netherlands and spend time with our family. So. And learning the language And ourselves. learning the language. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so as the traffic gets a bit busier, uh, we, we're going to cut this podcast short. Okay. I think uh, we covered a lot of ground today, <laughs> but you know, I, I'd love to do this again with, with both of you. Uh, and this three-person format seems to work really well. In Delft. So, in Delft, yeah. <laughs> where it's fun. In, in, you know, in other cities, it's not so much fun. Um, so I encourage you to find Melissa and Chris on the internet at all the social media platforms. And uh, I wish you well as oh, you, thank you in, very further much. enjoy your life here in Delft. <laughs> Thanks, George. We've, we've done a lot of podcasts over the years, but this is by far the funnest. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to your podcast, too. All right, take care, guys. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.